placing the chat to access it. Paso la palabra a Julieta Marone, registradora y curadora de la colección de arte del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Julieta, adelante, por favor. Buenos días a todos. Good Bienvenidos morning. A Welcome to this de Voces new edition of Voices in Action, a cycle of chats of IDB Academy. My name is Julieta Maroni. I am the registrar and curator of the IDB Art Collection, the IDB Art Collection and Cultural Center of the IDB were formally established in 1992 to reflect the cultural diversity of its member countries and to serve as an educational and promotional vehicle that showcases the rich cultural production of the region. At the IDB, we are fully convinced that culture, creativity, and art are key resources in order to address socioeconomic dimensions of the bank's work and for providing also innovative solutions to and personal um, solutions to complex problems. As a transformational tool of a development bank, the IDB Art Collection aims to showcase the vast artistic wealth and also invaluable diversity of the bank's member countries. Art collections are important tools for reflection, communication, inspiration, and not just decorative objects. IDB Academy is the IDB Group's knowledge and learning platform to address the development challenges of Latin America and the Caribbean. And Voices in Action aims to inspire and raise awareness on the most recent and pressing development issues shaping the future and the development agenda of the region. This is the first encounter, the first meeting of a special edition of Voices in Action from the perspective of creativity. And for me, it is a great pleasure and honor to inaugurate this series with a very special guest, Rembert Yaorkani, visual artist, writer, and above all, Amazonian activist. He is from Peru. Rembert is in Washington, D.C. because of his uh, first solo exhibit in the United States, and we could not miss this opportunity to have a chat with him and learn more about his artistic work and also about his perspective as a contemporary artist and as an Amazonian indigenous activist. On the chat, you will see more information about our guests. We also, we're also joined by Anna Foladela, Director of Communications and Philanthropy for Amazon Conservation Association, a nonprofit organization that has been fighting for more than 20 years to protect the Amazon rainforest through a, an alliance of local organizations. Welcome, both of you. I would also like to welcome here to the IDB, the ambassador of Peru to the United States, Mr. Oswaldo de Rivero and his wife, Ms. Vivian de Rivero as well as the group of officials and authorities accompanying them. The Embassy of Peru is currently presenting Rember's first solo exhibit in the United States, Usuma, Spirits of Power. And for those of you following us from Washington, D.C. and the metropolitan area, I highly recommend this exhibit and you should miss this opportunity to see in person Rember's work. To begin this very interesting talk today with Rember and Anna, we would like to share a welcome message from Tatiana Shor, who is the chief of the IDB Amazon unit, who has a very interesting um, story to tell us about Hi, her I'm relationship Tatiana with Shore. Rembrandt. I'm the Amazon Unit Coordination Chief in IDB Bank. 
And this event that I have the pleasure, have the pleasure to, be to be opening, opening is the first, the first Voices, Voices in Action in session covering the culture and creativity field. This is very important because a lot of what we talk about the Amazon, we tend to think of the Amazon as bioeconomy, climate change, and other aspects related to the forest, which is not specifically creativity and culture, but the Amazon is probably the most interesting place when we talk about creativity. Not only about traditional creativity, not only about indigenous creativity, but especially about how modern contemporary artists think about the world, what we can learn with them about their vision of the world, and what can we can learn with them about their vision about the forest and all its cosmology. Here, by my side, I have a very, very interesting artist represented by this picture, which is Rember Yawarkani. Rember, uh, probably he's with you now, he doesn't know, but I've been to his father's house in Pebas, in Peru, in the Amazonian, which is just lower from Iquitos. And I visited his family, which is the whole family, is an artist family, very contemporary, very much in the understanding of the rhythms of the forest, the rhythms of the river, and how the cosmology that is present in the, in the forest can teach us about the forest. He has a, an expressive and interesting contemporary artist, which represents very much this cosmological vision of creativity and culture in the Amazon forest. It is enormous pleasure to have him with us. This is his um, picture, his representation, which stays in my office in the Amazon coordination unit, because I do believe that the creative economy in the Amazon is perhaps the most impactful sector in which we as a bank will be working with. Not only to bring them forward as a creative e ecosystem, but especially to learn from them. I believe that art can teach us much about the forest, can teach us about the ways of lives in the forest, and can teach us to look into the future. For us, art is the future, and it's a way to understand what we mean when we talk about conservation of the forest. So I hope we have a very good first Voices session, and I hope we'll be able to, in the following years, uh, for strengthen the economic creativity of the Amazon as an important economic um, strategy for development and making people's lives better, but especially an important territorial governance of the Amazon. Because art is the way we can look into the world, and art is the way we can touch people's heart and really start thinking about the complexity that it is to mean when we say, keep the forest alive. That will help us. Thank you. I hope you have a good event. Muchas gracias, Tatiana, por Thank este mensaje. You, Tatiana, Remember, for this esta message. obra que tenía Remember, eh, Tatiana this work of es yours, bajo la lluvia. La was showing is under the rain, bajo la lluvia. It's uh, one of the works, uh, part of the ITB's collection, and it has a lot of the elements that we see repeated throughout uh, your recent works, mythological characters, the black background. So for those who are not yet familiar with your work, could you tell us a little bit more about the creative process behind, behind it and what it represents? how you got to it, what is the relationship between myth and territory that is so present in your work. Good afternoon to you all, to those that are connecting via Zoom, but also to those that are here in present, and our ancestors in our mind and in our memory that are here with us today too. For the indigenous world, for indigenous people, mm, our territory, the land, is truly important. There is a physical one, a geographical one, a material one, but we also have another type of territory, which is invisible, which is the land of gods, of spirits, of witches, of um, healers, and it is in this territory where we also see different battles. 
es, impor eh, es importante que los territorios indígenas, por ejemplo, It's important to start defending indigenous territories and lands because if we don't have this geographical territory protected, the land of myths will also be at risk of disappearance. It will disappear, in fact. My work is basically populated by characters that have the shape of the first humans. The Uitoto world is full of mythological characters. There are many different versions of the creation of the world, of the creation of um, human beings, and none of them is truer or more false than the other one. One of these versions actually says that at the beginning of the world, the inception at the, in the origin of everything, we only had water, cold, and darkness. If you have seen my work, my work has a lot of black background because that black background was the possibility that the creator had how you, how you, Naima, how we call him. The black background is that space where the creator had the possibility of creating, making things. If we translate that mythological space to current times, that is the possibility that all indigenous artists, contemporary indigenous artists have in order to change the history of the community, the story of the community too. The shapes that we see in my work, these shapes that are anthropomorphological plants, butterflies, snakes, those are the first shapes that we had at the beginning of the world. There is a version of the, mytho of the Witoto mytholo mythology where human beings are the fruit of the land. So it starts crawling, and we have one first element that is called monauta, which is the sky heater, because the sky was very close to um, the land, and he had to hit the sky in order to be able to stand up. In this myth, human beings are crawling from the depth of uh, the earth to the surface, and the first beings are plants, are trees, are snakes, and so on and so forth. So my entire work is populated of, with the first shapes that we had at the inception, in the origin of everything. So I think that those people that are not linked to the indigenous world may think that the indigenous myth is a story from the past, but for indigenous people, myths are alive. Indigenous people live with those myths and influence their lives on a daily basis. For example, in Uitoto, we believe in dreams. If there is a dream, or if we didn't have a good dream, if we had a nightmare, that can really have a big impact on our daily life the next day. And you may go or not somewhere, maybe you had something planned, but if you had a bad dream, you may change your, your plans. So that's what my work reflects. But here we're seeing my work reflections with tobacco, grandpa, grandpa tobacco, which speaks to those things that have not been talked about for a long time in Peru, which is knowledge 
misappropriation. There are a lot of contemporary artists that go to the community, literally take knowledge away, then they move it to a contemporary space. And that's something that was common in the 20th century. It was acceptable. But we, indigenous artists in Peru, believe that those practices in the 21st uh, century amount to robbery and or stealing and stealing on a very uneven play field. So that's why we try to engage with academia and with the art community in Peru to see how we can build a society or artistic movement where there's no vertical work, but rather a more horizontal um, playing field where everybody's on an equal footing. A lot of the topics that Rember addresses in his work, in a way, describe the beliefs and traditions as a common thread that a lot of the Amazon people share, especially in terms of their relationship with nature, the forest. And I know you have very interesting questions for Rember, so go ahead. Thank you, Julieta and Rember. Thank you so much again for being with us today. It's an honor to talk to you and see your work in person. And after looking a little bit at your work and listening from you, I am very curious and would like to know more about the environment that you grew up with and that turned you into such a creative person. So for those of us who are not familiar with that, how was it growing up in an indigenous community in the Amazon and how did it shape you in, and turn you into what you are today and how did you become a spokesperson for your community? Those are very difficult questions to answer, but let me try. Well, growing up in a community in the in the jungle, I grew up in Pebas. In order to reach Pebas, you have to go Lima, the capital of Peru, then you have to take a one and a half hour flight to Iquito, which is the largest community in the Amazon. And then if you're lucky, and if you can get a hold of a quick mode of transportation, you go, it takes four hours. Or the normal way can take 15 and up to 18 hours. Pebas is a small town by the mouth of a river where you grow up fully immersed in the jungle, tied to the trees, fishing, agriculture, and you are very much influenced by your grandparents. The exhibit at, Peru, at the Peru Embassy that is being shown to that Today it's called Usuma, which means grandparents, but grandparents in the broader sense of the world. The ones that you have a blood relationship to, but also that can impart knowledge on you, can protect you, or a healer can also be an Usuma. It's a grandfather figure. Here we see in the picture my grandma, Marta. I learned all of the stories, myths, and anecdotes from her, as well as some medicine. In, in the Witoto world, when a grandparent dies, not only do they leave this physical void, but rather a void in our memory, in our myths, and a void that may not be filled. And here I'd like to say, that the impact that COVID-19 had in the jungle, and specifically in Pebas and us indigenous communities, not only in Peru, but also the Huitotos in Colombia, was very high. It took the lives of a lot of indigenous grandparents, leaving a huge void and leaving us youth pretty much orphans. So our grandparents' generations, when they tell a story and when they tell a myth, it's very different from when my father, for example, tells a story. And it's even more different when I tell that story or myth. 
Entonces, si nosotros, los indígenas, so if we, indigenous communities, are not able to, in our land, and in our, in our growth, do not manage to protect our grandparents, our healers, our community leaders, our voice to the world, the voice of the youth to the world will be weak. It will be very weak. It will be a voice that does not have the power or the spirit that they have. When we, uh, young people, uh, speak at a meeting outside our communities, it's not just us speaking. We always feel that our ancestor spirits are here, our usumas, our grandparents, because at the end of the day, we are the result of their lives. And we say what they've taught us. And now, outside of the community, if we, if I talk about cities, this year I decided to do um, curatorship. We have a lot of um, indigenous philosophers and professors, but not in Peru. In Peru, we have a big void, which I hope may be filled in the next 10 years. So I had this exhibit, Nuyo, which means go back to our roots. Uyo in our Witoto community is the first word. When humans come from the bottom of the earth, they don't know how to speak. They could not speak at all. But as they walk through the jungle or through the mountains or forest, they find the great snake, the anaconda, and they see this very colorful being. They get scared and they say, Nuyo. So that's our first word in our Witoto myth. And we decided to call this exhibit Nuyo because it's our first exhibit of contemporary indigenous art curated by an indigenous artist. And it was like the first, the starting point. And that's why we named it with Nuyo, our first word. Hopefully we'll have more to follow. And so we put, we gathered the exhibit we gathered the works of art and we took him to an art gallery. And we chose an art gallery because we believe that our work should be exhibited in contemporary art spaces. Because unless we do that, our art will continue to be considered secondhand art that is like on the margins of the quote-unquote official art. That's why we must access contemporary art museums, contemporary art collections, contemporary art galleries, art fairs, and everything related to contemporary art. Remember, remember in 2020, we, the, this, uh, the El Canto de las Mariposas, a documentary led, directed by Nuria, a Catalan and Peruvian artist, a cultural manager, a filmmaker and producer. And this movie opened in over 20 festivals all over the world. And it does a very good job of depicting that relationship with your grandmother's voice in the community. And we have a very uh, short bit to show. I hear grandmother's voice and I can't hear her, and if I can hear her voice, <laughs> what do you call butterfly? Tuturo. Tu tibu puede ser juego, puede ser lo interesante, es tu historia. 
tell your story. Patrón del tiempo del Cauchner, me mataban a los huitotos. Me cortaban su oreja, me metían a tener un hueco, les quemaban. No sabían cómo iban ellos a librarse. Sí, sí, sí. Esto aquí con los llamados con Yo no tengo a otro lugar donde ir para buscar mi origen. Mi gran responsabilidad es que la palabra de mi abuela no se pierda. Remember, what I truly find interesting about your work is that you have an environmental message that runs very deep. A lot of your shapes and characters are based in nature, such as leaves, fish, and everything else that was depicted in the movie. And this connects very well what, with what we're trying to do in the Amazon as well. We focus on protecting uh, wild areas, protecting the local population, and also put science and technology to the serve, to serve and we also we want to incorporate traditional knowledge in uh, conservation efforts and oftentimes this knowledge comes from the myths that you mentioned earlier and that are reflected in your work my question is from the indigenous point of view why do you believe it is so important to protect and preserve the amazon it is extremely important, not only for the indigenous community, but for the entire world. And in that, art plays a key role. We believe that each work from each indigenous artist should be a political act. We, the Huitotos, survived to Caucho. My grandmother survived the rubber area where over 40,000 people were killed. So, so we don't have time to waste and think about whether our work will be liked by certain groups or not. Like I said, each work of art by indigenous artists should be a political act. I believe we must be rebellious. We are rebellious, but without being radical about it. We have to be rebellious, but without being radical. We indigenous must be rebellious because over the entire course of the 20th century, we, our voice was taken away. Society in general, especially the academia, and I'm talking about social scientists in particular, took our voices and made it their own. They took it away from us. So art has been the first tool that we've found that enables us to speak in first person. Without any translators, 
and without middlemen. One of the things that I still don't understand whenever there's social conflict in Latin America is why do we always, when negotiating, why do we always need translators? How come we're not included to in negotiations where we can um, talk directly to the other party. So the art hasn't meant all that. We have recovered our voice. We are speaking in first person. We have done away with historical stereotypes. For example, that an indigenous person cannot manage its own future. Art has helped to do away with such stereotype. Art has helped also to do away with other ideas such as that an indigenous person doesn't have art, doesn't have a philosophy, doesn't have, for example, doesn't understand about architecture or medicine. I believe that the physical diversity of nature of the Amazon can be defended through art. Indigenous people have to be included in political decision-making processes as well as economic decisions. I've been talking about this for many years in Peru. Ministries in Peru must have indigenous professionals. Now in Peru, we're starting to see well-trained indigenous professionals that can be part of the government and can actually contribute based on their own experience. I believe that every time we lose part of the rainforest, part of a mountain, some plants, some trees, it's not only indigenous people that lose, we all lose. However, indigenous people will not be able to conserve the Amazon by themselves, and we all know this. Indigenous peoples need allies, they need partners, they need operations in place. They need laws that protect them. We need, in Peru, for example, we do not have political representation in the government. Indigenous peoples need political representation. Indigenous also need to somehow be part of the economy of the country. And I believe, and this is uh, my last comment here, I believe that indigenous territories need to be autonomous. I think autonomy has to do with democracy. Autonomy doesn't go against democracy, quite the contrary. It provides a group of people, such as indigenous people, the possibility to manage their land, their future, in cooperation with the state. In Peru, we have two autonomous territories. One is the One Piece, autonomous territories, if I am not mistaken. And autonomous lands or territories will guarantee indigenous people's survival. And their survival for the coming centuries, because our land is everything to us. There are very complicated concepts involved in all this. For example, the concept of house, when we, indigenous people, or rather, when we, because somehow um, I live in a, in a city, so when I, li when I think about a house, I think about the square footage of, a, of an apartment or a house. But when an indigenous person thinks about a house, that's where they sleep. But it's also about their chakra, which can be one or two kilometers away. Their home is also the river where they go to fish, and that can be five kilometers away. The entire territory is their home. 
creo que lo que nos va a tocar a nosotros y en eso so, somos responsable toda esta gente, toda la nueva generación. Here the new generations have a new responsibility, which is to work together, work together on equal footing, for sure. We need collaboration, genuine and possible collaboration. What relationship do you see between conservation and art? How do you think conservationists can join forces with artists? And I'm asking this because many times in Amazon Conservation Association, we carry out different programs with children that live in conservation areas and indigenous communities in order to promote environmental preservation um, and we truly want to encourage um, an attitude towards environmental protection since they're very young they and we basically connect to them via art workshops they draw for example a jaguar or things they see in the forest, in the rainforest, in their home. So I would like to know a little bit more uh, your opinion about the link between conservation and art. The group of people that will take care of the Amazon is the new generation and children, basically today's children. And children are the best art critics that we have. They have no external influence whatsoever. I believe that art and conservation, at least in the indigenous world, is the same thing. Paintings in the indigenous world, in all indigenous communities, is an activity that has been part of us forever. We totos have Fidoma, who's the god of um, paintings or paint, the first painter in our culture. And I believe through conservation and through the painting contest, what we are encouraging among our children is change. We are creating possibilities. There, there's something that happens a lot in Latin America, and it has to do with corruption. We are well aware of it. When there is corruption in a country, when there is corruption in a project, you're not stealing from those that have more. You're not stealing from those that have the least. You're taking away an opportunity or a series of opportunities, taking it away from that group of people, the indigenous peoples, or people that are much farther away that will never have that opportunity in order to access a painting competition, school of art, a university, and so on and so forth. When corruption undermines all this, what you're doing is stealing an opportunity from a girl, from a boy, the opportunity to change her family, her community, her city, her village, and in turn, her country. So what I do believe is that Art and conservation are the same thing. They're interrelated. We can raise awareness about how important it is to protect the Amazon, but you're also creating opportunities that could actually change an entire society, and they could actually have a lot to contribute to a country. We have to strengthen our countries we have to make sure that our countries collaborate. We need to make sure that our societies are less individualistic. We, indigenous people, come from collective societies. We have collective values. Therefore, 
different from many other artists, contrary to other contemporary artists that do a much more individualistic type of work, we indigenous artists carry out a much more collective type of art. If a, an indigenous artist becomes an individual artist without thinking about their culture, their country, their community, we will lose a highly valuable a moral value for society in general, which is that collectiveness. Thank you, Ember. I love how you have connected many of the topics on which the IDB works. And you've linked all those to art. Now I'd like to see if we have any questions from our audience. Yes, Julieta, we have some questions. First, the, our participants are thanking us for this space. The first question is about something that is gaining a lot of interest within the conservation world, especially with the COP meetings of the United Nations and all the discussions about climate change. The, and it's about the key role that indigenous people work I mean, that the indigenous people play in climate change mitigation. Amazon Watch developed a study that shows that indigenous territories are one of the best mechanisms to prevent deforestation from happening. They're also carbon drenched in the Amazon. Remember, what do you think we need in order to protect the Amazon? What, do you, what messages do we need? And how can we move forward? Even how can we take small steps? We need laws from the government to protect environmental leaders. Uh, in Peru, for example, since the pandemic started, if I'm not mistaken, 18 to 21 indigenous leaders have been killed. Indigenous peoples can protect different territories, but logging mafias or my illegal mining mafias or drug trafficking mafias, once they access indigenous territories, it is the government that needs to stop them. It's government laws and legislation that will help to protect us. So far, no killer of environmental defenders have been actually found guilty and prosecuted. Therefore, we need laws to protect indigenous leaders, definitely. And now going back to the indigenous territories, currently there's something really worrisome taking place in general in the entire Amazon region. Climate cycles, natural climate cycles, as in my town where we had winter and summer, those cycles are not taking place as 10 years ago. Right now we should be in the winter in the rainforest, but we are having summer temperatures with water levels way below normal levels. And that has an enormous impact on absolutely everything. Fish migrations, animal migrations in general. On the types of, it also has an impact on the trees uh, that provide fruits, and that has a serious impact not only for those living in the Amazon, but also for those living in the cities. So we need legislation, basically. Thank you. Another question from our audience. In your opinion, what roles should development banks play in this relationship between the Amazon, conservation, and art? What role deberían tener los bancos? What role should banks have? Well, I believe that, first of all, there 
There should be strict control in the companies that invest in the Amazon or that have operations in the Amazon. We need to try to make sure that these companies have indigenous partners. And I believe the indigenous communities sh should partner with development companies, be it banks or other types of uh, businesses that have uh, businesses that do business in the Amazon. And to have an environmental impact plan that is implemented, that really impacts us because a lot of the, for example, oil companies in the Peruvian Amazon do not abide by what they say they're going to do in terms of environmental protection. May I add something? A lot of these financial institutions have art collections as well. So I believe that showing in those art collections the voice and the opinions of our contemporary indigenous artists is key. And if I may, I would like to link this to a question that I have for Rembert as well. And how is, how do you view yourself, Rembert, in the contemporary art environment today? And what do you think your, your near future would look like in terms of uh, in being present in art exhibits or art galleries? Basically, what's coming? What's coming is a book. And currently, my main objective is to start a movement in Peru that we have called the Contemporary Indigenous Art and to have presence in Peru's important museum collections and outside of Peru as well. We want, or rather I want, to have fair trade, that is to say that works of art by indigenous artists be traded in fairly. Over the past few years, there's been something like that, but trade in our arts is very unfair. This is imposed by the art market and some private art institutions as well. And I'm saying this because if we draw a horizontal line over the 20th century, indigenous artists have always been exploited. We've always been some sort of slaves to something or to someone. And pretty much everything has been taken away from us. We were left with pretty much nothing. All we have left is our knowledge. So if we are not able to, in multiple ways, value that knowledge, in other words, capitalize on that knowledge, we are not going to have anything to leave behind in the world and to leave our children or nieces or nephews. My interest is to see indigenous contemporary art have a seat at the universal contemporary art table. I want indigenous artists to see that as a result of their knowledge, they are given an opportunity to have better, a better life. And that's why what you said is so important. That is to say, to include indigenous artists in art collections, to include photos, video arts by indigenous artists, and to also include the voice of our grandparents. There are a lot of exhibits, and with this I will conclude, a lot of, there are a lot of art exhibits where indigenous people are shown as being extinct. We've always been depicted in some sort of picture or video. So isn't it time 
to show indigenous people in a different light, no longer as a decorative artifact, but to give him a seat at the table, like I said. My main concern is that at the time. Thank you, Rember. I believe there was one question from the audience. I don't know if you can get a microphone, please. And with this, we will conclude. Oh, I, I am given the luxury of closing. Piqué Arroyo, I am Peruvian as well. And I wanted to say that I feel extremely proud to see you here today, to listen to you and acknowledge my ignorance to your art and your culture. My question goes back to what you were just talking about, how you indigenous peoples have always been slave to something or someone. I believe in Peru and in a lot of our countries in the Americas that slavery exists, even though it's not present in our minds on a daily basis. So my question is, your, your request to educate our population in revitalizing our culture is key. In Peru, we saw this, for example, through food. Unlike the past today, we are proud of dishes that used to be tucked away because it, it, it was something that your grandma would cook and you were not going to show case internationally. And the same happens with art. We need to love what's ours and showcase it. So your cultural experience with your call to kick off education and to have cultural revitalization to support your work and what you're doing. Thank you for that invitation to love what's ours because it's very important. It's very important for the Amazon, not only for Peru, but for the entire world. So thank you so much. Okay, I have two things to say about that. First of all, let us not deny our roots and our origins. There's no reason to deny what, where we're coming from or who we are. According to archaeological testing, we, indigenous peoples, have been in the Americas for over 20 million years. So it's a culture that has survived and will continue to survive. So, like I said, there's no shame in acknowledging that you are indigenous and, you, and the fact that you speak a different language or you think differently. And also to create opportunities for dialogue and to create new spaces, to have new discussions, new debates, new proposals, be it art or politics or, I don't know, economics, and to also create new markets to be able to show our work, our art. And from the comfort of whatever we are, be it here, Lima, or in any capital anywhere in Latin America, we should try to do whatever we can to do to preserve what's out there. When I'm in Lima, I said, in order to create change, you don't have to leave the comfort of your home. Every decision can be made, be it here or anywhere else. If it's the right decision, it will have the right impact, be it in preservation, art, politics, economics, architecture, etc. And let me conclude by saying, that we must include everyone. If we're going to talk about indigenous topics, or if we're going to work on indigenous uh, project in indigenous territories, we must include indigenous communities. At this time in Latin America, there are a lot of professional indigenous peoples in Peru and Brazil, and these indigenous professionals have a high level of ethics that, and they're willing to work for their people and their country. 
and they have to be included. There's just no other way out. We won't see changes otherwise. Okay, I believe this brings us to the end. And from the Cultural Center at the IDB Art Collection, we would like to thank Rember for giving us this opportunity to talk about your work, your activist work. And we will continue to follow um, your artist career shortly. Uh, we wish you all the best and thank you so much for being with us today, Rember. Thank you very much, Julieta. I would like to thank eh, the eh, bank eh, in, in, for this very unexpected invitation. I would also like Estados to Unidos thank the U.S. Embassy in Peru eh, because they did everything in their power to make sure I would get my visa, and they were extremely kind to me. Thank you to the Peruvian embassy here in the United States, and where everybody was also very kind to me. And thank, thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, thank you, of course, for to Ala Coladena for being kind enough to join us in this uh, discussion and to bring the vision of uh, an organization such as Amazon Conservation work to protect these communities and our Amazon. Thank you, Julieta. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Rember, especially. I would like to invite you to know a little bit more about what we do at the Amazon Conservation Association and to embark on more projects with the IDB so that we together can have a more sustainable, stronger, and more vibrant Amazon region. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you to all of you who were here with us today, to those of you who joined us virtually everywhere around the world. Please remember to fill out the survey, survey using the link on the chat or this QR code, because this can, helps us continue to offer quality and relevant content to everyone in the region. We hope to see you in our next uh, event, December 2nd, Creativity in Voices in Action with Jose Lazalle, who will talk about the intersection of metaverse and creative and cultural experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you.